Un placer estar con ustedes. Mi nombre es Juan Tello Mendoza y hoy tengo el agrado de entrevistar a Estefan Colep, economista búlgaro alemán y director académico del Ludwig Edhard Forum for Economy and Society, con sede en la ciudad de Berlín, así como profesor de economía política de la University of Applied Science Zwickau de Alemania. Estefan es doctor en economía por la Universidad de Hamburgo y se especializa en la historia del pensamiento económico, particularmente el ordoliberalismo, la escuela austriaca de economía y la escuela histórica alemana. Actualmente, al igual que este servidor, es becario del James Madison Program de la Universidad de Princeton, lugar donde desenvuelve el proyecto que nos reúne en esta ocasión. Una nueva biografía del economista austriaco y filósofo social Friedrich Hayek. Stefan, thank you very much for being, for being with us today. Oh, well, thank you for having me, Juan. I look forward to the conversation. Excellent. So, to put it all in context, please explain to us who Hayek was. Okay, so let's start with the life dates. So Hayek lived throughout the 20th century. He was born in the last year of the 19th century, and he died in 1992. He was born in Vienna, um, spent the first 30 years of his life, broadly speaking, in Vienna. He got his university education there. He was a very promising young economist who, uh, in the very early 30s, had the chance to move to England, to the London School of Economics. Then he got into all kinds of debates, among others with John Maynard Keynes or with uh, market socialists and some other debates. Then when World War II started, he switched from technical economics to what we could call political economy, the most famous result of which was The Road to Serfdom, a book published in 1944. Then in 1950, he moved to Chicago. 1962, he came to Germany. And with a brief period in the early 70s in Austria, he remained in Germany until the end of his life. So an Austrian economist who early on understood that being only an economist is not enough. So he would always say that an economist who is only an economist is at best uh, unpleasant, but uh, potentially also dangerous and um, not a good servant to society. So he was somebody who understood himself as an economist, but in the course of his life expanded uh, the fields of interest um, very much into the fields of law. Uh, psychology, evolutionary theory, and uh, several other aspects. So economics as his core, but then studying fields which we today, and also back in the days, are nicely captured with the notion of philosophy, politics, and economics, PPE, as it would be called in Oxford. He was an, he was an important scholar, but he was also an influential public intellectual who... Um, in various points of his time, uh, could be quite important for political figures and for certainly shaping the intellectual climate um, in the countries he lived, but also beyond by founding some organizations and uh, yeah. yeah, by participating in many, many discourses. I think that might be a good introduction. Oh, thank you for that. So the next question people may have is, Why do we need a new biography about Hayek if we already have some about him? What makes it different in comparison with the others? So volume one of the biography was just published, right? So mm -hmm. the University of Chicago Press published volume one, which covers Hayek's life from 1899 until 1950. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, If you look at the book, which I obviously recommend because it's co-authored by my two friends, Bruce Caldwell and Hans-Jörg Klausinger, mm -hmm. you see that it's a very complicated affair. So if you try to combine the context in Austria, in uh, England, starting in the 1930s, the family context, how his idea came into existence, how his ideas evolved, how his ideas influenced the times, 
what kinds of cultural aspects underlay the debates he was participating at. This is quite a big thing. And by the way, um, the biography is really also about the person himself. So a lot of things have been written about Hayek, but the synthesis, which you can find in that book, including a lot of new sources, a lot of new correspondence, which has never been used, especially um, from, the, from his families, um, makes it a really, really important new resource. And it's, by the way, also a captivating book to read. So it's uh, not just 800 pages, uh, but it's 800 pages which you really keep turning and you keep reading. So um, it combines a lot, which had never been combined before, and it adds quite a bit, uh, which is genuinely new. Yes, that's true. The first volume was already published uh, last year. But you are the co-author of the second volume of this biography. Please let us know what we can find there and how you get involved with this exciting goal. So I'm extremely grateful to my two co-authors to, to have co-opted me in this amazing project. Um, we have known each other for many years and, um, and economists quite often believe in the division of labor. And so um, even though, of course, each and every one of us is in charge of everything, mm -hmm. we have to focus on various aspects and various periods of the book. And so my task is to think about Hayek in the German context. As I mentioned, he came in 1962 to Germany and stayed there, roughly speaking, if we subtract some years in Austria, in the early 70s for, for the last 30 years of his life. So the question mm -hmm. is, why did he get to Germany? Um, how did he feel there? Did the German context, both political and intellectual, have an impact on his later work, starting in the 60s and 70s? Um, uh, whereas my other co-authors uh, will be in charge of, um, of other aspects of um, those 40 years. So he lived, as I said, until 1992. So we have to cover the Chicago period. We have to cover many controversies which happened um, within that intellectual family which he created called the Montpelerin Society. We have to cover certainly what he's famous and infamous for, uh, the notion of neoliberalism, meaning that in the 70s and 80s, important political figures were influenced by Hayek and were uh, in exchange with him. So in that regard, um, there is a lot to be covered. And um, yeah, I hope that my contribution, which again will be the German context, can show that uh, it mattered that he moved from Chicago to Germany and let's say not to Spain or to uh, Italy or to um, back to England. Uh, many people have said that he could have been, he could have lived anywhere. So Germany was not a natural choice or um, not something which had to happen, but uh, I do believe that it uh, it mattered um, for him and for the way he thought about Western democracies and um, whether they needed radical reforms. Um, yep. Yeah. So that's that will be my part in Volume Two. Awesome. If so, why do you think Hayek's theories nowadays are crucial? particularly to Europeans. Okay. So what's the main message? Um, what's the main message of Hayek? Okay. The main message of Hayek is that if we start with Adam Smith and the division of labor, so each and everybody, each and every one of us can specialize on something uh, and we divide labor along that pattern, Hayek would add a certain nuance which is important, which is that um, we actually participate in a division of knowledge. So each and every one of us participates in sharing and constant resharing and reformulating knowledge. So each and every one of us has some very specific, very personal, I would say very nerdy knowledge. And the market economy uh, when it is properly framed, is actually quite a quite an amazing machine which can channel that knowledge which each and every one of us has and which 
each and every one of us feeds into the market economy as an entrepreneur. It doesn't have to be a market entrepreneur. It can be a social entrepreneur. It can be, uh, it can be anything. And so, um, this division of this division of knowledge is actually how Western civilization, but also basically the modernity we entered two hundred fifty years ago, has enabled normal people like you and me. Um, to make use of our uniqueness, of our individuality and all that. Now, why does that matter? Well, everybody today speaks about information technology and about um, uh, the fascinating new world which we have entered technologically. But if you think of one specific aspect which we as scholars sometimes use and sometimes use it with a bit of a shame, Wikipedia. So Wikipedia was created uh, by somebody uh, by the name of Jimmy Wales who, who read Hayek and said, hmm, interesting. So Hayek says, we have those bits and bytes of knowledge. Why don't I feed in, why don't I enable people to feed in their knowledge, which they very specifically know. So Juan knows about something very specific about human rights. So why don't I enable him to plug in that knowledge into Wikipedia? So if you think of the global economy in its complexity which is impossible to understand by a human mind but it's also not, not necessary to be understood by a human mind Hayek would tell us that um, the fascinating dynamics of this complexity is the product of of us as individuals um, and we play those games all the time if the rules of the game are well well structured, those games are positive. Some games, so in a certain sense, um, they um, produce winners and winners. But we have to find good rules so that the games between you and me and between everybody else um, is um, positive. Some game he uses the notion of catalectics. In Europe, over the past seventy years, has been a search. For exactly that. So how do we, as Europeans, I'm from Bulgaria and Germany, as you mentioned, my Spanish was good enough to understand that. How do we frame the common market, things like data protection, things like, like any domain of human activity, so that this division of knowledge into which some hundred millions of Europeans participate becomes materially, but also normatively a good order, right? So it should not just be about cheap coffee, right? So I love cheap coffee and especially I love cheap and good coffee. And miraculously, people who specialize on coffee have given us that. That's wonderful. But we should also think about the rules of the game, formal rules and informal rules, basically law and culture, which enable us not just to have those products and to get people out of poverty, which is what economics is about, but also to enable something which friends of Hayek have called the humane economy, right? An economy which enables a life in liberty and justice, right? So economists or political economists, more precisely, are those people who understand those processes of positive sun games, of win winners and winners. But I also understand how those games depend on conditions um, which are not given and which have to be reformulated uh, every now and then, actually probably um, permanently, so that the game produces those good results, so that the game produces results um, as societies in which we would like to live. Uh, but again, you as a lawyer know much more about the legal rules than I can be than I can know as an economist. So that whole task is not given to the economist. The economist know about knows about something, he knows about markets or basically about mutual exchange. And you as a constitutional lawyer um, is the person with your specific knowledge which can combine with what I know about markets so that, we get a better European project um, than the one which we currently have. So it's really a permanent search 
a permanent experimentation with various rules so that those domains of mutually beneficial exchange called markets, uh, so that game of division of labor and knowledge works as good as it can. I think that's the whole quest of liberalism and Hayek as a liberal political economist, I believe, gave us interesting formulations, interesting insights as to how that can be done. And well, perhaps let me add a footnote. So in the course of his life, as I mentioned, he understood more and more that the market economy cannot be defended only in terms of economics, right? So this idea that it depends on rules and it depends on culture, on a bourgeois culture, mm -hmm. which is very difficult to sustain um, and which can be destroyed at any point of time as he experienced multiple times in, during his lifetime in the 20th century, that he understood better and better, right? So the beauty of economics doesn't mean that the playing field on which those games are played is stable, right? So um, it's a fragile world. And I believe today's fragility, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you assess many things which are happening, remind us that the liberal project is something which is wonderful, but which can break at any point if it's not resilient, if it is not For absorbed sure, yeah. those multiple shocks and then has a capability to um, nevertheless adapt, rebound, and re constantly reinvent itself. Each and every one of us individually, but also on the, on the level of the system or order. What an exciting uh, project, dear Stefan. Excellent. Did this books, oh, sorry, this book is a requirement for our, our intellectual preparation. Um, we all wish you good luck with this enterprise. And we will be looking forward to knowing about the second volume when it is ready. Thank you again in the name of the Tokeville's Club and our best wishes to you. Muchas gracias, Juan. Thank you. Gracias. Thanks Hasta luego. Thank you.